everybody again on the second episode of Biblical Hebrew, another introductory class. We're not today still not going to look at the language itself, but we talk around the language a bit, but some examples. Um, the, the topic of today is what exactly is Biblical Hebrew? Because there's different types of Hebrew. You might think if I learn all the letters and and I, all the words, then I know Hebrew, then I can read the Bible, I can understand the prayers, I can go to Israel and talk. Um, is biblical Hebrew the same as, let's say, modern Hebrew, the language that's spoken in Israel? Um, spoiler alert, it really isn't. Because just think, languages constantly evolve, right? It's not that one language is the same over the centuries, and and, and content, languages change, although it goes so gradually that you don't necessarily notice it sometimes. But if you would interview, let's say in America, in Europe, people, older people, and you, would, and you would really carefully study the words that they use and you go to young people, you would see that there's words that they use that the older people doesn't use or hardly uses. I'm just gonna give you an example in English. If we go back, um, let's say, um, what is it? 600 years ago, right? That's the difference between biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew is somewhere between two and 3000 years. So uh, some people even, and some, some texts might even be older than that. So, uh, or, or the, look, the Exodus is uh, generally estimated to be like 30, over 3,300 years ago. So that period from then to now, you would, ex you ex you would ex if there is any, that is a long period of time. So 600 years is actually hardly anything if you compare it to Hebrew, but go back 600 years, 600 years uh, in, in, in the history of the English language. Now we, here we have an image, uh, I don't know if it's based on reality, probably not, of Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer is uh, one of the first, well, one of the first, yeah, known authors of English. And his book is uh, called Canterbury, Canterbury Tales, let's say 300 and, uh, what is it, 330 years ago, roughly. Um, if we read the story, we, you would see that it's, it's quite different from what to, how do we speak now. The story of Alessander is so commune that every white that hath discretion hath heard somewhat of all his fortune. This wide world, as in conclusion, he went by strength, or for his high renown, they were in glad for peace unto him send. The pride of man and beast he laid down. Where so he came unto the world's end. Now it sounds better than that. It it looks harder when I pronounce it. It's easier. So it's partially the the spelling that has changed. But in modern he, English, this would sound be the history of Alexander is so commonly known that every person who has good judgment has heard something of all his fortune, his, this wide world in the end, he won by strength or for his high renown, they were glad to offer him peace. The pride of man and beast he brought low wherever he came unto the world's end. Um, it's a bit different, right? 600 years ago. Do we go back just uh, another few hundred years back? This is, we're not 100% sure, at least a thousand years old, but maybe even 13 years, 100 years old, which is still a lot less if you compare modern Hebrew, the time difference between modern Hebrew and biblical Hebrew. But this is Old English. Fair was Harpen Swag, Swooten Sengskops, Sag the Sethe Kuth, Rumskaft Fir, Fioran Rekkan. Quav fat se olmetiga orden wort. And that means there was the sway of the harp, sweetly sang the poet. He, able to relate it, told about the creation of men of long ago. He said that the Almighty made the earth. So that's a big difference. 
if you have time, you can compare, and then you would recognize if you heard it in there, Almighty, El Mehtiga, uh, etc., etc. But uh, uh, that instead of said, uh, and and some other words, um, swag is the sway, right? Okay, and Eordan, Earth. Okay, there are some, but it is definitely, and I probably pronounce it even more modern. I'm not 100% sure how it was really pronounced in those days, but um, if you, if somebody would speak fast, it's very unlikely that somebody from modern and modern speaker of Eng English would understand the English from a thousand or 1300 years ago. So similar, you could expect from Hebrew, and it's actually, there are differences that makes, it's clear now, it would be a miracle and in this case, the miracle is lacking. It would be a miracle, it would be unnatural for a language to stay the same, if only because new words are introduced, right? The Torah doesn't have a word for electricity or microwave or uh, stovetop oven and stuff like that. Just give a few uh, trivial examples. So of course the language has to change and it's, if there is a miracle here, the miracle is or at least that's a surprising fact is that Hebrew changed almost so little that you can still understand a lot if you, uh, and, and, and after more than 2000 years, let's say 3000 years, that words are still somewhat understandable. Now we'll look at the, the next picture. Hebrew, so we have biblical Hebrew, and this is the topic of today. Um, but there's also rabbinic Hebrew, which is sometimes called Mishnaic Hebrew. Um, so if I'm a rabbi and I speak Hebrew, that's not called rabbinical Hebrew. Rabbinic Hebrew is really Hebrew from the time of the Talmud. So Mishne, from the Mishnah and, and, and that period. Then we have a third uh, kind of Hebrew, medieval Hebrew. And I will talk about rabbinic and medieval in our next class. And finally, Modern Hebrew also will talk about that a little bit. Um, and so there's, there, there's four stages here of Hebrew and every stage you can see differences. But I wanna to focus today on biblical Hebrew because biblical Hebrew is not so simple itself. Even the, biblical, the, the, the books of the Bible have been, uh, have been uh, written over many centuries. So some books are much older than others. Some books are much later. They're also written in different locations, in the North and in the South. Some have actually been written in Babylonia and by different people from different backgrounds, different social status. Like there, we have a book of Amos, which is written by the prophet Amos, um, a shepherd. But there is others that were like in, from royal families or close to royal families or the priests, which were like somewhat of an elite group. Those are also, let's even if you go on, on the street and you talk to simple people, and I don't want to, I don't mean that derogatory at all, but people with um, maybe less of uh, education or in a minority group or, or in, in rural areas with farmers, they might speak, use different language than people from who um, are professors or, uh, or uh, politicians or business people. Everybody has their own lingo, their own words that they use. And that was also the case in Hebrew. So we have to look even in biblical Hebrew. Now you could say, you could say, um, but the Hebrew is the word of God. God doesn't come from different social backgrounds. He's not from different locations, he's in heaven. So there's only one location, right? But there is a principle that, that the Torah, and, 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 I, and I like to take that in a bigger, that God speaks to humans in the language of people, meaning he speaks in the person's language. If there's a message that, 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 that the Torah or that the prophets, uh, that the prophets receive from God, it always comes out in the language of the person, of the prophet, right? So in order to understand the message, it helps to know actually the language of the person. Otherwise, 
let's say if I say, um, if I would call uh, my home an apartment and other call and someone else calls it a house or a mansion or a flat or whatever it's called. It, let's say an apartment building in here in New, in, in America, these, 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 these uh, homes in these taller buildings are called apartments. But in England, they call it the flat. So that's because of the different locations. They use different words in the different locations, America versus Great Britain. Now, if you don't know about it, you might think, ooh, an apartment and here I see flat. So what is the difference between apartment and a flat? Maybe you would come, you start to develop a whole theory that really it's not the same because there's, there's different words, so they must mean something different. But if you just know that this is the, the usage of the language, then the problem is solved, right? So it's very important to understand the language of the, in the Bible, let's say the prophet or the sage or the, the wise person or the king or whoever uh, is responsible for the words that are written there. So we have one thing within even biblical Hebrew, within the Hebrew Bible, we have older texts and later texts. The next one, we have texts from different regional dialects. I already mentioned North and South, for instance, but also others. I want to look at it a bit closer. We have different styles. Uh, for instance, you have, if you write poetry, like a poem, that would be different than writing, um, as you have, let's say, in the book Bamidbar, Bamidbar Sinai, there you have, let's say, uh, lists of counts of people and tribes and with the names of the heads of the tribes. That's a different style than, for instance, poetry. Um, we have people, the prophets or the writers from different social, social status. All right, I, I kind of mentioned that. This is a nice repeat. And, and so, but there is the old, older language versus later language. The language changed. For instance, let's say you have here Nabi, it's a prophet. And Ro'eh, which literally means a seer. And there is proof in the Bible itself that these uh, that the words have changed over time. Because what do we see here in the book in book 1 Samuel 9, verse 9? There it says, previously in Israel, a person would say when he went to inquire of God, when, when you want to ask God something, you go to a prophet and you say, uh, Oh, this prophet, he knows how to communicate with God. He has insight. Let me ask a, a question to the prophet. He would say, come on, let's go to the seer, to the ro'eh. Because the person known as a prophet today, this is when the text was written, was formerly called a seer. So you see here already in the Bible itself that now we call somebody a navi, but before we called him a, a ro'eh. Now we call him a prophet. Then we used to call him a seer. It's the same thing. It's just a different term. So this is an indication in the Bible itself. This, this author of 1 Samuel uh, says, um, he says, um, you know, language changes and Hebrews has changed even in the time of the Bible. Okay, now, for instance, another, another uh, example, you have two words for I, anochi and ani. Ani is used more often and uh, anochi uh, less. Now, anochi seems to be um, an older form, but prophets sometimes use older language, even when it's less, you know, um, less used. So uh, some prophets use a lot of anochi. A lot of prophets use more ani. And in modern Hebrew, anochi is really not said. It's, it's, it's now ani only. But um, this seems to be a... Um, could also be a difference in style. I'm not sure if it's more formal anochi or versus ani. But um, as I have uh, read opinions that this is due to older versus later language. Now, let's look at a map. So you see the different regional dialects. Look at the blue here. The blue is the kingdom of Israel. And the south here in the middle is called kingdom of Judah. So the people of Israel, when you said in those days, the people of Israel, you thought of the people of the north, of the kingdom of Israel. And the kingdom of Judah, that's where the name Jews come from, because Judaism is actually descendant of this kingdom. This kind of disappeared, mostly. Um, 
So it's known that people in the North use different vocabulary, different words sometimes than people in the South. And also people are within the kingdom of Israel on the other side of the Jordan. So here is the river Jordan um, also had their own dialect. And you see that the kingdom of Israel is closer to here, the kingdom of Aram. There's different Arams, but this Aram of Damascus and here have other Aramean tribes and the Assyrians also used Aramaic, but Aram is the, they spoke Aramaic. And so there seems to be a little more influence of Aramaic on the North, but that's not the only thing. In any case, there is, it's a complicated matter, but there are differences as you see here in, uh, in language between North and South. Go to the next slide, North and South. All right, <laughs> I already said that wasn't so necessary. Okay, examples here. For instance, um, there is a word gerem for bone. The bones are in my arms, for instance. And there's also a word asem. So asem or ngetsem, whatever you, how you pronounce it. Uh, we'll talk about pronunciation later. One of the uh, explanations for the different terms is not that it means something else. I'm sure that later uh, commentators have come up with explanations that point out difference of meaning because they weren't aware that this was a dialectic uh, difference. But modern scholars believe that gerem was a term mostly used in the north and aetsem in the south, asem or aetsem or ngetsem in the south. Another example, asher, which means which is or the one who, asher kidishan misutav, the one who uh, sanctified us through his commandments, Asher. Now, She is shorter. There are, uh, there are modern scholars believe that She uh, originated more in the north. And, and by the way, um, as a, a general rule of thumb, the north made a lot of words shorter than the south. So if you have two words that are practically the same, but one is shorter, then in many cases, the shorter form is, comes from the north. Which is, uh, which is interesting to know. I'll give you, um, we do not know for sure. I mean, it's hard to prove, but it may be that there's two words for the mountain of God, Sinai, right? Mount Sinai, Sinai in Hebrew, but there's not a word Horev, like in English, Horeb. So there are theories that Horev is really the no Northern word and Sinai, the Southern word. Now you might say, well, both appear in the Torah. Uh, but it's possible that uh, to be inclusive, even even if Moses wrote the whole Torah, he could be want to be inclusive of of both dialects, so that uh, the the different tribes would all understand it. Who knows? You can you can you can fantasize on that. But uh, I'm just saying there are people who seriously say that Horev is a northern word for the mantle of God, and Sinai the southern word is another one. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, is full. his full name is Eliyahu, and there's a short word, Eliyah. Now, this is another example, maybe, how in the north, uh, the, some of these words were shortened. So Eliyahu, shorter form, Eliyah, supposedly was the northern form. And you have that with, with, with many cases. Um, and then you have Uziyahu and Uziyah. You, get, you have two forms, and... The, the shorter one is possibly, uh, people believe, the northern form. Um, Yehoshua, that's Joshua, but Yeshua uh, would, should be a northern form of Yehoshua. It's definitely shorter. And specifically, these letters, huh, the, the, the H, Yehoshua, and Yeshua, this, that's, that kind of letters, uh, are, uh, typically fall off in the north. And even in the time of the Talmud, by the way, and just digressing a bit, but there are reports that people from the north, especially from the very north, the Galil, the Galilee, um, that they that they weren't you, can, you couldn't hear the difference between one word or the other, and we'll we'll get to that another time. Now, there's also uh, another one. There was somebody called Nahum the Galilean, which means he is from the Galilee, and. Um, 
He lived in Al Kosh. We don't know where it is. Is that Babylonia or, or is that Capernaum, which is on the on the on the border of this lake here, the Lake of Galilee? Not sure, but he did. It seems clear that for a while he also lived in Babylonia. But for instance, there's a word Nazar or Nazar, and he pronounces it as Natar, which is exactly what happens also in Aramaic. So this seems to be an Aramaic influence. And you see, as I wrote down here, the Galilee is very close to uh, Aram. So it's not, wouldn't be so strange. Okay, I showed you some things. Now, social status. So Amos, I already mentioned, was a shepherd. And, um, and so we'll give some examples uh, how things are different in his lingo, in his words. The word metzik or metzik, which is uh, he's pressed down, he, he pronounced, he, he, in, in, in Amos, it occurs as me'aik, also something that could happen in Aramaic. Uh, uh, muta'ev is there, muta'ev, so the ayin becomes an aleph, something, a confusing thing that was rare in those days. It's very common now in modern Hebrew uh, that the ayin and the aleph are confused, but uh, that also happens in Aramaic a lot. And here's an interesting Isaac is in Hebrew Yishak, and he writes it as Yishak with a sheen. Although the sheen and the sheen weren't really distinguished yet uh, in his days, that's much later, but it seems uh, most likely was it been a sheen, Yishak. And drowned, uh, Nishka'a is Nishka. So the ayin, Nishka'a, Nishka. So Nishka'a, Nishka, he hardly probably pronounced that, pronounced the ayin. Maybe Amos was the first modern uh, Hebrew speaker, uh, I'm kidding, but it's very, it's, it's some, some ways similar to modern Hebrew, the mistakes that he makes, so to say. Okay, we continue. So there are different styles also. We have stories, we have poetry, we have laws, like legal language is different from poetry or from stories, right? We have speeches, A speech also is different, and we have wisdom teachings. Those are different, different kinds of writings in the Hebrew Bible that all have their 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 their, their own um, how do you say their own style? Okay, there's also there's also prophecies. So when a prophet says, "Thus speaks the Lord," I I shall smite your enemies, for instance, that's a prophecy. A prophecy has a different style, and admonition is, woe unto you, if you do not repent, I will send the plague, and an admonition is maybe similar to a prophecy, but you could say possibly a different uh, altogether. We're, we're approaching uh, the end of the second class. Um, still, the differences of style within the Bible are not huge. So if you know biblical Hebrew, it is the, you have some general biblical Hebrew, you will have maybe some problems with certain with certain um, unusual texts. Let's say you know the, 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 the language of the Torah, which is pretty straightforward in many cases. If you go to prophets, prophets are cryptic, meaning they're puzzling. They are sometimes have different, have unusual words. They have... Um, double meanings and things like that. So there are um, sometimes words that we don't really know what it means because they're only used once or, or twice, but we don't really know that happens. But in general, if you know the general biblical Hebrew, you can basically understand a lot of the Bible and to be honest, also of the prayers, which is a later style of Hebrew. So about thousand years ago, the scribes, have added signs to fix the pronunciation. Those are the vowels. We're going to talk about that uh, in one of our coming classes. They also applied the same rules for all the texts. So even though there were different dialects, perhaps, with different pronunciations, maybe one person said um, Rosh, and maybe somebody else said Rash, and maybe somebody else says Rosh, or every, they put the same vowels, the same pronunciation signs, on every case of that word, so the differences are kind of disappeared, if they if there were any, any anyone, right? So um, that makes sense. So it simplify it makes it simpler. So as a result, different parts of the Hebrew Bible now look more alike than they probably did or originally, right? So the because of uh, and a thousand years ago is very late. Of course, we can 
also speculate that the pronunciation may have changed over the times before the sounds were written down. I mean, it's very hard to reconstruct, to know how Hebrew was initially uh, pronounced. I go to our last slide, ladies and gentlemen, and then you just have to wait till the next one comes available and I'll do my best. Um, all right, sometimes when there are unusual forms or forms that became unusual, the scribes gave instructions how to pronounce the word differently. There's uh, sometimes you have for you is atta for a man and at for a woman, but you have also forms that have ati. It will just say it will just say this here, ati without the vowels, ati. It actually has an e at the end. But because the vowels, the little dots in and beneath the word, direct us to that, not say ati, but at. Right? So there are different forms. Ati might have been an older form, but it became un un not used. And so the, the vowels, much later, have, 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 have been put it, the signs have been put in and underneath the letters so that we don't say ati anymore, but at. Also, sometimes there is who, that is he. And the word he means she. It's confusing, right? He means she. But in any case, the word Hebrew word he means she and who means he. But sometimes you would have, look at the very bottom, you would have, it, it actually says who, but it's written, but it is about a woman. So there might have been um, a period in time where the, 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 the form for a man as we call he, right? The form for a man could be used for both a man and a woman. So you could say who for a man or a woman, but he only for a woman. So you see many times that actually the letters itself say who instead of he. But then the scribes have written the vowels in a way that you see you're not supposed to say who for, because it's, not, it's a woman, you say he instead of who so because it was became weird to say he for a woman like you say she uh, we have other forms like that also Naar, uh, young man was also used for young woman and later they they wrote a sign that you have that says Naar, but you have to say nada because that is young young woman right uh, nowadays or later in any case I hope this was not too confusing the last little piece uh, but we're going to get to that uh, again. This is only the introduction. Introduction, and what I mean, mean with this last point is that the signs in and underneath and sometimes above the letters have made it more regular, have made the, uh, have made the language of the Bible that has differences more the same. So it is, it is still a great thing to, to study biblical Hebrew. I, what I wanted to say in this class is that you have different types of Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, Mishnaic or Rabbinic Hebrew, Medieval Hebrew, and Modern Hebrew, to the four most important uh, uh, division groups. And I, I described how even Biblical Hebrew is not as straightforward. But next time I'm going to compare Biblical Hebrew with later forms of Hebrew. So that's the promise and you can look forward to that. If this was complicated, just listen to it again. So it's uh, it's handy stuff. You can absolutely learn Hebrew without knowing this. Uh, but is it preferable? No, it's very useful to understand what's going on and, and why certain things are irregular and why there are different words. And so I encourage you to try to understand this at least. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again uh, on our next episode of Biblical Hebrew. Thanks for your attention and have a wonderful day. Bye -bye.